sermon this morning is actually going to be more like a Bible study. We're going to be spending the majority of our time this morning in Philippians 2. You're used to, a lot of my sermons, we go back and forth, we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture, and we'll jump around a lot. We're not going to be doing so much of that this morning. And uh, this is one of my favorite books of the Bible, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And what we're preaching about this morning is I'm, going to, I'm trying to get through to your heart. You know, any, any important decisions that we make, any, the, the way that we live our life, it's all going to come and start from within and start with your heart. There's a lot of instruction that we need to have. There's a lot of instruction that we get from the Bible. There's a lot of do's and don'ts, right? And they're all important. And we're going to study God's law. We're going to study God's word. And we need to know those things. But I'll tell you what, those things are going to be meaningless if your heart is not right. You have to want to do things. You have to want to love God. You have to want to obey God's word. And you have to want to do things and to help other people out. And what we preach about this morning, and the title of my sermon is called Being Ministry Minded. Being Ministry Minded. Now, that word ministry is thrown around a lot in churches all over the place. You hear it. I think a lot of people don't even necessarily think about it, understand what the word means, because it gets thrown around so sloppily sometimes. I think it gets used for things that aren't even really technically ministries. It's just you're doing something and they call it a ministry. Ministry means you're ministering or you're serving somebody else. You're helping someone. That's what a ministry is or ministering to someone. It's you becoming a servant and helping somebody else. It's not about you. It's about them. That's the you know basically a broad view or a general view of what a ministry is. And what we see here in Philippians, look at verse number 1. The Bible says in chapter 2 here, <coughs> If there be therefore <coughs> any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So chapter 2 is, is starting off here. And he's saying, look, aren't are these good things that there's any consolation in Christ? Being consoled, being comforted, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit. He's saying, fulfill ye my joy. It's his joy for the Philippians, for other people to experience that same type of fellowship, the same type of love, the same bowels and mercies and the consolation in Christ. He's saying, fulfill you in my joy that ye be like-minded, that you have the same type of mind, that you have the same attitude, that your heart is right, that you have the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He said, would to God we could all have this type of an attitude. We can all be joined together with this type of a love, with this type of an affection. Look at verse number three. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. What's strife? Strife is fighting. He said, no, let, you're not supposed to be serving God and, and having ministries where you're just fighting or vain glory. What's that? It's all about me. Right? And that's one of the things that the church of Corinth had a problem of. They were, they were striving within the church, and they were saying, well, I'm of Apollos, right? Well, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, I'm of Paul. And they, were, they had these leaders that they, were, that they were lifting up, which, hey, they're great leaders, great men of God, right? Amen. You can, we can see how much good that they did, and they're great teachers, but what they were doing is they were kind of turning that into a strife or contention of saying, well, I follow this guy, and I follow that guy. And it was vainglory. Instead of just recognizing they're all serving Christ. You know, we all should be serving Christ. That's the thing. We should be coming together with one accord, with one mind, having the same love. And, you know, look at what those men were all about. They weren't about lifting themselves up. They weren't trying to get some great following after themselves. They were trying to point people to Christ. Amen. That's what it's all about. That's why they were ministering so much. Is because they're trying to reach people to Christ. So he's saying here, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's not about us. It's not about fighting. Uh, there's a time to fight, but when it comes to this ministry, that's not what he's referring to. You know, we need to fight and defend the faith that was once delivered unto us, the Bible says. But when it comes to serving others and having this attitude that we're preaching about this morning, I'm, <coughs> we're seeing in Philippians 2. This isn't about fighting, it's not about vain glory. 
It says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. This one phrase, this one verse, can go a very long way to solving a lot of problems that people have in their day-to-day -day life. That churches have within the church. That people, that, that marriages have within a marriage. So many problems come from our own pride and, and lifting ourselves up and not showing a lowliness of mind and esteeming other better than themselves. What does that mean? When you esteem someone better than yourself, it means that you're valuing them higher than yourself. Just like John the Baptist, you know, with Jesus Christ, he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. It was all about helping him and serving. What was Jesus Christ about? It was all about serving others. Yep. He wasn't, he didn't come to this earth to lift himself up and to sit on the throne. Now, he will be sitting on the throne when he comes back the second time. He's going to come and to rule and to reign. But when he came the first time, he came as our example. He came to serve. He came to minister, not to be ministered unto, the Bible says. He came to serve others. He healed the sick. He, you know, spent all night in prayer. He'd get up in the morning real early. He'd go out, heal people, preach the gospel, teach God's word. It was always about helping other people. Because when you're bringing the gospel, what are you doing? You're helping them out. You're, you're bringing other people to Christ so that they can avoid a da an eternal damnation in hell. So they can be saved and go to heaven when they die. There was nothing in it for Jesus. He wasn't charging people money to heal them. That would have been wicked. He was serving other people. He was going in the name of God to serve others. That was what Jesus Christ was all about. And in lowliness of mind. And think of, it, you know, how hard is it going to be for you to have a lowliness of mind to see other people better? You know, do you really think you're that great? Look at Jesus. Are you better than Jesus? Of course not. If he was able to esteem other people better than himself, which is evident through his actions of going out and serving other people, then how can you not? And see, this is important. Those of you, I know we have visitors this morning, but... I'm not going to be, I'm going to be moving in about a month and starting a new church in another area. But whether I'm here, no matter who's here behind this pulpit, you all need to have a ministry mindset in your life, regardless of who is leading you. This is something that's important for everybody to have. This is what the Christian life is all about. It's about service. It's about ministry. You say, yeah, but I don't want to pastor a church. It's not just about being a pastor. Look at who is the, 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 this epistle to. It's from the Apostle Paul. I mean, it's literally from God as the author, but this is from the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, to the church at Philippi, to the people who are congregated together, and these are the instructions that he's giving them, that they need to have this mindset that ministry is not just about you getting a certain position within a church. It's about who you are and what you do and how you esteem other people and how that motivates you and drives your life. There are ministries that you can be a part of that aren't even necessarily having anything to do with being established within the church. We think of ministries as a ministry leader for this. And look, I'm not opposed to using those terminologies. That's fine. But what I'm trying to get across this morning is that you can receive from God's word what's trying to be expressed here, that you can be like-minded, that you can experience the consolation of Christ, the comfort of love, and that fellowship of the Spirit, and fulfill joy by being like-minded, having the same love, and being able to esteem others better than yourself. And having a lowliness of mind, staying humble, not getting lifted up with pride, not getting so caught up and wrapped up in yourself that you don't care about anyone else. There are lots of ministries that you can do when you serve people. We're going to get into this later, but the number one thing is just reaching out and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's something that everybody should be doing. Everybody should be participating in that ministry. There's plenty of other things that you can do, too, where if you, if you get this mindset, if you can... Be constantly reminding yourself that I need to stay humble. I need to esteem other people better than myself. So you're going to be thinking about how can I help that person. 
I can put off maybe something that I want to do. I, I can put that on the back burner because someone else needs help and I'm going to help them. That's the mindset that's being expressed here in Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Do you spend your time just completely focused and, and caring only about yourself? Now, is it important to do things, to take care of things at home and take care of things for yourself? Absolutely it is. We shouldn't have to be dependent on other people. We should be able to be self-sufficient and provide for ourselves. There are things that need to be taken care of. Men that need to go to work, provide for the family, bring home food. You know, things that need to be taken. My wife has a job to do at home. She needs to raise our kids. But you know what? That shouldn't just be what our life is all about. Just about ourselves doing things for us and ourselves getting by. We need to be thinking about other things. It says, but every man also on the things of others. Not only am I going to take care of myself, but how else can I help other people out? It's easy to get so wrapped up in all of our concerns and all of our cares and everything we have going on. It's easy for me to do that. It's easy for me to say, oh, well, I got this move coming up, and I got this to do, and I got that to do, and I got to find a job, I got to do all this work. It's easy then to put aside, well, I'm not going to go soul winning today. Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to help this person out because I've got too much other stuff to do. <coughs> and you can fill in the blank for your, for, your own, for your own life. But this is something that we deal with on a regular basis. But we need to have our hearts right. We need to keep a lowliness of mind and not start thinking too highly of ourselves, but be considerate thinking how other people need help. Look at verse number five. Let this mind be in you what mind? The mind that we were just saying. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Steaming other people by yourself. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the mindset that Jesus Christ had. Verse number six, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Of course, Jesus Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was equal with God. Because he was God incarnate. And if God incarnate takes on the form of a servant, why can't you? Amen. Verse number 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. His obedience in service to God was unto death. Even when it came down to losing your own life, to losing his own life, he still stayed the course and maintained faithful, faithfulness. Now, a lot of people, they have a different line that they're going to draw. Well, I'll serve God, but only up to this point. Well, only if it means this. I'll serve God, but if, but if, but if I'm going to go to jail for it, forget about it. Right? And everybody's got a different line that they're going to draw. Well, you know where Jesus Christ's line was? There wasn't a line. He was going to serve God no matter what the consequences were. Unto death. Unto death. What, what else is there? Yeah. Unto death. Even the death of the cross. Even a torturous, excruciatingly painful death of hanging up on the cross. A shameful death. Whatever they're going to throw at him, I'm still going to serve God. I'm still going to do what's right. That was Jesus Christ's mindset, and that ought to be our mindset, too. That's why Jesus himself said, you know, if you don't hate your father and mother and brother and sister, he says, you can't be my disciple. And I preached on this last week, so I'm not going to go in depth, but we know, we believe here that you're saved by faith. It's a free gift. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved. You have eternal life. You cannot lose that salvation. Amen and amen. amen. It is not of works as any man should boast. Nothing that you do can earn your salvation in any way, shape, or form. But that is different. There's a difference between being a believer, which requires no work, and someone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ, which does require work. 
That's right. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it means you're following him. It means you're doing the way that he does. And that's why he says, you know, if you want to be my disciple, and what he means by that, and I expressed this last week, we're not going to turn there, but when he says you have to hate your father or mother, you can't put anyone else before God. You can't put anyone else before Jesus Christ. He has to be number one. Which means you have to be willing to, to part with or forsake everything else in order to serve Christ if you're truly going to be his disciple. You can't have that point to where, well, I'm only going to serve him up to this point. Well, I'll preach the gospel, but if it becomes illegal, I'm not going to do it anymore. Then you can't be his disciple. That's what he's saying. Doesn't mean you can't be saved. You can receive the free gift, but you can't be his disciple. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, like verse number nine. As a result of this, as a result of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and the obedience unto death, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. I love that passage. I'm not going to get off on a rabbit trail on that because there's so much you can preach there. But um, <coughs> the reason why I'm pointing this out is one of the ways to help keep yourself ministry-minded and thinking as a servant and thinking and esteeming other people better than yourselves is that you just remember in the long run it will work out for you. Anyways, God will take care and bless you and even reward you for being that type of a servant. You won't receive all the benefits necessarily here on this earth. You may be put to death. I don't know. I mean, this world is getting extremely wicked extremely fast. There's a lot of God haters out there. Not just God, there's a lot of Jesus Christ haters out there. But when you can remain obedient, you know, you can humble or abase yourself and let yourself be low. God will lift you up. Now, obviously, you're not going to be as good as Jesus Christ, so he's not going to give you a name above every other name. But that's the name that Jesus Christ got because he is better than everyone else because he was God. He was perfect. He was without sin. But the, the, the point here still stands is that when you allow yourself to be a base, when you humble yourself, God will exalt you. God will lift you up. God will make everything right. God will bless his servants. And we need that's why we need to stay minded on the things that are in heaven and not the things that are on earth. Because if all we care about are the things in this earth, we're going to be focused on ourselves. We're going to be focused on what things can I collect? What things can I do here? What thing for me? What can I pile up for myself? What type of of money and, and goods can I accumulate and rack up here? But when you're thinking about things in heaven, well, how do you accumulate rewards in heaven? It has nothing to do with how much you can accumulate here on this earth physically. It has to do with your service to God, your service to other people. So when you work and you serve and you do the things that God commands you, He rewards you for that. Another reason why your works have nothing to do with your salvation. God proves that by the work, by rewarding you for the works that you do. You do get a payment for the works that you do here. He does. He not, I'm not saying that we necessarily deserve that, but to, to just fully express that salvation is a free gift, it has nothing to do with how well you live. God says, well, all the good things you do, I'll reward you for that. When we can remain humble, we don't have to worry. God will exalt us. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Look at verse number 14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And this is an important aspect of where our heart should be. Remember at the beginning it says, um, not let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. You know, when we serve God, when we serve others, we shouldn't just be fighting about it and, and be concerned about vainglory. 
But the things also that we do should be without murmuring. What's murmuring? Murmuring is complaining. Right? When you're serving God, when you're serving other people, when you're trying to do what's right in ministry, don't do it with a bunch of complaining. Oh, man, I got to go and do this. Oh, I can't. I, I wish I didn't sign up for, for this ministry in the church. I wish I didn't, didn't do that because it's just taking too much of my time. It's the wrong attitude to have. Your heart's not right. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Again, disputings, fighting, getting, getting in arguments, fighting. Let's just serve. Verse number 15, that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. <coughs> Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So the reason why he's saying do all things without complaining, without fighting, is he says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. That you can have a good testimony. Because people observe you serving. And the way that you serve, and if you're serving with complaining, if you're serving just with a bunch of fighting, people will pick up on that. And you will need rebuke. You will... Not to be blameless. You will not be harmless. You're going to actually bring damage to the cause of Christ when you're not doing it, serving with the right attitude. Let's keep reading. Jump down to verse number 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. See, the Apostle Paul, and you can read this through all of his epistles. He genuinely cared for the people he was writing to. Notice in how many places does the Apostle Paul name people by names? Salute Antipas, salute this person, salute that person, salute, you know, hey, help this person out, their fellow laborer in the gospel. And, and he goes, you can read at the end of Romans, especially the last chapter of Romans, it's all just a bunch of names of people that Paul is praying for, that he's thinking about, that he's concerned about. Yet he's met people in all these places where he's helped to start churches. He knows people in Philippi, in Colossae, in Thessalonica, in Rome, all over the world. But he genuinely cares about these people. And you can see that even in the book of Acts where, where him and Barnabas are like, hey, let's go check up with all these people that, you know, they care about them. They labored night and day, traveling and working with their hands and supporting themselves so that no one else would have to do anything for them. They worked, they provided for themselves, and they were willing to impart even their own souls unto the people that they were serving. That's having the right attitude, the right spirit, the right heart. And that's what's going to allow you to get the most done for the Lord. When you're not only doing but your heart is right. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. So he's sending Timothy, Timotheus, unto the Philippians here. He said, I'm going to send these people, send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I may be of good comfort when I know your state. He's concerned about it. He cares about it. I want to know. I want to be comforted just knowing and hearing from Timothy how you're doing. Look at verse number 20. For I have no man like-minded. Now, how do you start off verse number two, fulfilling my joy that you may be like-minded? He's trying to get more people to be like-minded. But what's the problem? He doesn't have anyone like-minded. Right. What was the problem that Jesus said? You know, the fields are white in the harvest. Laborers are few. Pray, therefore, that God will send laborers into the harvest. There's nothing complicated about living the Christian life. People always try to make things really complicated and really hard and difficult. It's not. The only way it's hard is because you make it hard because you don't do what God's saying to do because your heart's not right. That's it. That's the reason for the difficulty. It's not complicated. It's very easy. It's, it's very simply spelled out. It's not all about you. You're here to be a servant for the Lord and to serve other people. Pretty simple. 
I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. What a shame. What a shame for a man of such great influence. Who himself is sold out to serving God. And giving such a great example of believers of how to do. I mean, would to God that we could have people today that could live a life like the Apostle Paul did. And yet, even with that influence, and with that example, and this is coming right off of Jesus Christ being on this earth, and, and that example, still, he's saying, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. This is an important topic. It was important then, it's important now. Do you seek just your own? Are you just concer con concerned about yourself? Do you see the soul at any time and say, well, I got other things to do. I'm busy. Do you come across other people in your day-to-day -day life that you know are lost? They're not saved. And you say, oh, I got other things to do. I'm busy. You're part of the problem. Praise God if you're saved. But what are you doing? Are you serving? Are you helping? Are you serving the Lord? Are you like-minded? Do you naturally care for other people? Does that come natural to you or do you have to force it? If you have to force it, you better start forcing it until it becomes natural. One of the great things, one of the things I love about the Apostle Paul, when, when you again you read the book of Acts, when he was he was waiting for his friends to show up, he goes over to Athens, and and you know, he's just sitting around, and the Bible says, you know, as his manner was, you know, he starts preaching the gospel. He can't he can't hold back, he can't withhold, because that was his his he, he had trained himself and gotten to this natural state of caring for other people and preaching God's word to where even when he's just kind of waiting around and, and he's got plans and the works that are going to you know, continue on and travel and, and preach the gospel in other places, he's kind of hanging out and waiting. He still just can't help himself. That's the type of mindset we need to have. Even when you're vacationing, right? It's just kind of relaxing. There's still, there's still the urge and the desire and the care for other people. Minister to him. Jump down to verse number 25. Paul says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Even the Apostle Paul had a minister. This is someone else that was like mine. It calls him my brother, my companion in labor, my fellow soldier. He's doing the work. He's in the battle. He's in the fight. He's serving the Lord. He says, your messenger. He said, he's sending him. And see, these are people that the Apostle Paul benefits from. Epaphroditus, Timotheus. They love the Apostle Paul. They care about him. Epaphroditus ministered unto Paul. Yet what does he do? He still sends them away. Oh, you need it more than I do. Why? Because that was his heart. He cared about them. If he only cared about himself, he could have kept the Epaphroditus around and just, hey, keep ministering unto me. Keep helping me. Keep supporting me. And he said, no, you go help them. They need it more than I do. That's the mindset. They ministered to my wants in verse number 26, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, 
and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness. Look at this. And hold such in reputation. And these are the types of people that you ought to be holding in high regard, in reputation. Because these are people that minister, they serve God, and he says the reason why that he was even close to dying, he almost died, was because of his service to Christ. In verse number 30, because for the work of Christ he was dying to death. That's why he almost died, because he was serving the Lord that much. He was dying to death, not regarding his life. Right? He didn't value his own life. He cared about other people. He says, to supply your lack of service toward me. What's a, this is pretty stern. Paul's Paul saying, you know, maybe if some of you would have been helping out a little bit more, Epaphroditus wouldn't have been, like, almost died. You said, he was fulfilling a need. There was a need here. He was ministering unto me. I needed some help. He decided to take upon himself to serve and to help and to minister because you guys weren't doing it. He wouldn't have had to do all that if the Philippians could have helped out a little bit more. And we need to remember that. Look, there's a lot of people that are in need today. It's not just the pastor's job to go and help people out. When you know that people have a need, especially within the church, hey, that's all of our jobs. Now, at the end of the day, of course, the overseer, the pastor, is responsible that things are going to get done. The pastor is going to lead. The pastor is going to take charge and to help. And you know what? At the end of the day, I will make sure that, is, to the best of my ability, people's needs will be met here because that is my job. But it's not just my job. Ministry is everybody's job. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, everybody has a job to minister, to help other people out. It's not just delegated to one person or one person within a church or two people or someone who holds a specific title. It's not what it's about at all. Turn it through to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Why? Because they're actually doing. They're working. They're ministering. 
So he says, you submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and labor. So we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a few pages to the right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's many different ways for you to minister. And look, if you say, I want to serve, I want to help, what can I do? Right? Maybe, maybe you're thinking, maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe, maybe there's more I can do. Maybe I've been focused a little bit too much on, my, on, on myself. There's lots of things to do. Don't just wait for the church or for the pastor to say, hey, you do this. Because it may not ever happen. One thing you can do is approach the pastor and say, hey, I want to do something. I've got some time. I want to help people out. Can you help me? Tell me what you can do. If you come to me, I'll help you. Believe me, there's a lot of things I've been wanting to do for years in this church, but haven't found enough willing laborers to do it. But there are plenty of things to do even without going to coming to someone like me. There are plenty of nursing homes in the area, in Prescott Valley, in Prescott, all over the place, that are filled with widows. You know, the Bible says in James, it says, Pure religion undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion. That's good religion. That's the religion that God wants us to follow. There are people you can go visit. And I'll tell you what, as someone who's done a nursing home ministry, it is a blessing. Not only a blessing to the people that you reach, it's a blessing to yourself. There is joy and comfort and peace that you will receive when you go out and help other people in need. In many cases, don't even have any family or friends or anybody visiting them. You can go and spend a little bit of your time serving them, bring your Bible, you know, read with them, pray with them, help them. You don't need me to tell you to do that. You can do it. There's lots of opportunity out there. And like I said, I'll help you. There's prison ministries. You know, a lot of churches have prison ministries. That's great. But you don't need to have a ministry established by the church to go and do that. Go ahead and do it. Come to me. I'll help you. I will help you with, with planning, organizing, supplies, whatever it is that you need. I will, I will serve you. If you have a heart to serve others, there are lots of ministries that we can be a part of and we can do. It's only limited by you and what you're willing to, to do and to even think of to help people out. There's many different ways for you to minister, but there's one ministry that all should be a part of. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Hey, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, if you're trusting Christ to be your Savior, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, verse 18, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. The reason why you're saved, because before you had Christ, you had a problem with God as a sinner, as someone who's broken his law. But because Christ paid for your sins when he died on that cross and rose again from the dead, when you put your faith in him, that reconciled you back to God. You're back in good standing with God. Makes sense, right? Yep. Well, let's keep reading this verse. He says, verse number 18, let's read it again. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. We're reconciled to him when we got saved. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us that job. He's told us that you are to minister and to get people reconciled to God. He explains it further, verse number 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, 
we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So what he's saying is that we've been committed with that, that ministry, that job, that function of helping other people that have a problem with God because they're a sinner and they're not saved to be reconciled with God. That's our job. We are ambassadors for Christ. What's an ambassador? It's someone who represents somebody else, right? Jesus Christ is not physically walking around on earth today. He needs an ambassador, a representative, someone else that can step in and represent Jesus Christ to other people. Since he's not walking, that's what it means by in his stead, since he's not here. We need to go out, we need to represent Jesus Christ to get people reconciled to God. We are to be that mouthpiece of God, of Jesus Christ. When we bring the Holy Scripture and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you go through and you explain all the various verses and ways how people can know for sure that they're saved. That is our job. That is our ministry. To get people reconciled to God. You don't need a special gift for that. That is not only specific people's jobs. That's everybody, every believer's job. To be that type of a laborer. If you're worried about ministering and you want to serve, why don't you start with that one? I mentioned previously there's a lot of ways to minister and serve and they're all going to be good. And praise God, I hope you do some. But if you're not doing anything, why don't you start with this ministry? We have a time established for this. You don't have to set up anything brand new. We're meeting at 2 o'clock today. You can come out with us. You don't even have to say anything. You've never been before. Come, come along. You can be a silent partner. You can just see the way things are done. And you can be a help. And you could, you could sacrifice some of your own time to help other people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to get saved. Amen. And to be that ambassador. Let's keep reading here, verse number 21, then we're going to go continue into chapter 6. Verse number 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Continuing on here in chapter 6, verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. So again, we're workers together with Christ. We need Christ. Obviously, to get people saved, we can't do it on our own. It's not something that you can do in the flesh. We need Christ working and laboring with us to help reconcile people to God. But we are those ambassadors. We need to be doing our job. We, we don't believe here that people are just automatically going to be saved without hearing the gospel from someone preaching the gospel to them in order to believe. We don't believe that. We're not Calvinists. We don't believe that God just picks and chooses so regardless of what happens on this earth, well, they're just saved because God chose them. No, we don't believe that. We believe that the ministry, the work of reconciliation is given to us. And guess what? If believers stop preaching the word of God, if believers stop being ambassadors for Christ, then a lot of people are going to hell. Yeah. Because that's a job that's been committed unto us. Amen. It has been entrusted unto believers. We're workers together with him. Verse number two. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation, and I suffered thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distress. We'll continue on through this. A little bit, but the, my last point this morning, last point, we're almost done, is that in order to be an effective minister, and you have your heart right, you want to serve, and you decide, I am going to serve, we need to have a ministry or a service of the people that is going to be blameless, right? So the, the way you're going to be most effective is by, is by keeping yourself unspotted from the world, like it says in James. By making sure that you are living a life that is not one just rank with hypocrisy. You want to serve other people, you want to try to teach them the truth and show them God's word, yet they look at you and you're like, well, 
know, the Bible says not to do this, not to do that, not, you know, not, not to not to fornicate, not to drink, and not, you know, and you're doing all these things. All right? Well, that's not being very blameless. Now, it doesn't mean that what you're saying is false, right? You may be preaching the, the truth, and you, you could be right. And to some level, we're all hypocrites on some degree because, hey, I believe every word of this book, but I'll tell you what, I'm not perfectly sinless. So, of course, there's a level of hypocrisy. Of course, I do things that the Bible says that we shouldn't do. But there's a big difference between not being perfect, which nobody is, and someone who's just, just way off into whatever sins, right? It's just very obvious and just, just that's, that's not a good testimony. People aren't going to want to listen to you. How could you say you believe this and you're doing all this stuff that are really bad in the Bible? We need to be blamed for it and to have a good ministry. We want a ministry that's not going to be blamed. We're not giving offense in anything, but in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. If you care about it, if you have the right heart, you're going to want to do the best job. You're going to be used of God the best way that you can. So what are you going to try to do? Get rid of the, the things that are holding you back. Live a life above reproach, above rebuke. And that will help you to have the most effective ministry. And then he continues on here. And then we'll read through. Um, this is a great passage. We're almost done. Uh, approving ourselves as based on God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. So there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come your way that's going to make it hard. Right? It makes it harder to do. It's, it's, not, it's not always an easy job ministering to other people. There are afflictions. There, you need to have patience. You need to be able to see it through. You need to not just quit at any sign of resistance or opposition. <clears throat> you prove yourself when you have patience, when you can deal with the afflictions, when, when you're in need, you have necessities, when you're in distress, you have problems, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. All, none of these things are comfortable, are they? You know, tell me ministry is not going to be a comfortable job. You're going to face opposition. There's going to be problems. Now, maybe you won't be beat and thrown in jail in the, the day and age that we live in right now in the country that we live in. Praise God for that. Thank God that we still have freedom to do some of these things and to minister and to preach the gospel. It's not always been that way. and There's many other places in the world right now where it's not that way. But right here especially, we think about these opposite, it's hard enough. Think about how hard it would be to, to minister when these are your threats, beatings, imprisonments. We don't have that threat today, so what's holding you back? I can at least understand a little bit more when people don't want to speak up for Christ when they can just be put to death. I can understand that. That makes more sense to me. I'm not saying that's right. Of course, the Bible says, hey, Jesus Christ is faithful in the death. But what I'm saying is that that makes sense to me. When people have that level of, well, yeah, I don't want to deal with that. But we have so many snowflakes these days that people don't even want to say, oh, well, my cousin or someone else in my extended family might be offended if I say anything about Christ. Don't worry about that. That is such light affliction. You don't even have to mention it. He's talking about beatings, imprisonments, tumio, fights, labors, watchings, fastings. Verse number six, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Unfeigned is not faked. Genuine love in your heart. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich. Again, that's that humble attitude, that's poor. We have nothing. I don't have physical goods, but I'm making other people really rich. And he's not talking about physical goods, making other people rich with, with, my, with money but rich in heavenly things. So we're poor, but 
We're making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Why? Because you have nothing physically on this earth and yet possess so much. So much good, so much re eternal rewards in heaven for the work that you do. So check your, check your heart. Is your heart right? Are you ministry-minded? Do you live your life in a way, in general, where you're thinking about other people, where you're concerned about other people? And, you know, we just got done in April doing our, our prayer challenge. Praying for other people is a good way to be ministry-minded because you're focused on other people. One of the requirements of our challenge was to, you know, focus on and pray for everyone on our prayer list. Well, you know, a lot of people will pray and they'll pray for themselves. Okay? And look, I pray for myself. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for yourself. The problem comes in when you're only just praying for yourself. What about other people? That just demonstrates you're not very ministry-minded. You're not really thinking about other people. This challenge, hopefully, has helped you already just to be thinking about other people on a regular basis. Concerned for them, having charity, caring for them. And when you start off with that in your mind... That's going to be a lot easier for you than to turn that into action. When you're praying for people on a regular basis and you're thinking about them and concerned with them and praying for them, you're going to be a lot more likely than to be willing to go out and help them and do something for them than if they're not in your thoughts at all. Being ministry-minded, we need to get this mindset off of just our own selves and concerns and focus on how we can help and serve the Lord and serve other people. Our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that you do give us in your word. Dear God, there's, you give us black and white. There's no gray areas. We, we have a tendency to make things more difficult, usually as a result of us not wanting to do something. Um, people have a problem with making things more complicated or difficult than they really are. Lord, I pray that you please stir up our hearts and our souls and help us to have the right mindset. I pray that, that people here today would decide that, yes, I want to be an ambassador for Christ. I, 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 I'm a believer. You've saved my soul, and I want to help other people be reconciled to you as, as we've already been reconciled, Lord. And I pray that you please just move our, our spirit and, and help us to, um, to, to gain that. Maybe, 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 there's people that don't don't really have that desire and feel like maybe kind of cold. I pray that you please warm them and, and comfort them and strengthen them. I pray that you please help our church to, to be motivating unto one another, to provoke one another unto love and to good works, as your word says. Lord, help help this church, help this church to serve and to grow and to just do more in our service to you. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.